Stephen Pinker, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon ahead of your sold out event at the Sheldonian Theatre later on this evening. Uh, your latest book is Enlightenment Now, subtitled The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism and Progress. Uh, can you kick off by providing a brief introduction to the main arguments you make in the book? Enlightenment Now is a defense of what I consider to be the cardinal values of the Enlightenment, namely reason, science, humanism and progress. And it's an answer to the question, uh, if you are not a, a nationalist populist, if you're not a religious fundamentalist, if you're not a Marxist, what do you believe in? It's not enough to say, well, I, I believe in the, the establishment and the status quo. Uh, what's going right? And uh, I provide the answer, namely uh, an answer. If we uh, try to understand how the world works, if we set as our goal improving the lives of people, we can gradually succeed. And then the progress part in, uh, makes up the bulk of the book, and it consists of 75 graphs showing that contrary to an impression that, that uh, one would get from the papers, the world is improving. We're living longer, we're fighting fewer wars, more of us are going to school, uh, we are uh, uh, be better educated, we have more leisure time, we're seeing more of the world, and so uh, uh, quantitatively speaking, uh, life is getting better, and we have the uh, values of the Enlightenment to thank. One of the targets of your book is perception bias and human beings' general tendency to judge things based on subjective measures rather than on a long-term statistical basis. In other words, we should appraise our world by turning to data rather than to emotion and our own prejudices. Is this a fair distillation of your work and can you say a little bit more about it? It is a major theme of the book. I'm a cognitive psychologist, so I'm acutely aware of the cognitive illusions and fallacies and biases that we're uh, prone to. And indeed, the, uh, the, the reaction to Enlightenment Now and to a previous book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which also presented a, a data-based view of, of the world and of history, reminds me that the impressions that people have, the impressions that I have, uh, before stumbling across these data, can be wildly out of uh, whack with, with reality, simply because it's not so much that, we, that our impressions are subjective, as that they are based on uh, vivid anecdotes and narratives and events. We, um, uh, we, we read about a, uh, a, a rampage shooter and we think that the uh, times are getting more violent. We read about a shark attack and we're afraid to get into the water. We read of a plane crash and we think that, that uh, air travel is dangerous. All contrary to fact. And the illusion comes from uh, an interaction between the nature of cognition. Namely, we use our own uh, brain search engine as a shortcut to, uh, to, to um, uh, assessing risk and probability. If I can think of, some, of an example quickly, that must mean it, it is uh, highly likely. If you combine that with the nature of news, which is about things that happen, and not things that don't happen. And as long as violence and hunger and disease and, and so on have not vanished from the earth, which they never will, there'll always be enough incidents to fill the news. And so the world could have changed radically. That is, more and more countries might be at peace, more and more cities might have low crime rates, but you'll never learn about it from the news because the, all of these things consist of things that don't happen. And even if there are more of them, it is only data that can tell you that. One of the striking features of this book, and it's true of the better angels of our nature as well, is that it's a polymathic sweep through history, philosophy, anthropology, sociology, science, and probably a dozen other academic disciplines to boot. One is tempted to ask, how do you do it? How do you marshal these areas of scholarship and employ them to create such a cogent overall structure? It's a, a combination of, of um, just being, being curious and not being uh, impressed by academic silos and, and boundaries, wherever the, uh, the research is, I, I will uh, follow it. My training just as a social scientist means that I'm automatically equipped to um, feel comfortable with anything that involves data, even if it's from fields like sociology or political science that are, are not cognitive psychology. Uh, and um, I, uh, I also try to uh, immerse myself in a field enough that I know not just the claims that are made, but the kind of the culture of the field. Uh, what do people gossip about? What do they, uh, who impresses them? What are the pitfalls that they wouldn't be caught dead doing? 
and try to get a sense of the, the, the value system, the status hierarchy, the taboos within the academic field so I feel comfortable and, and try to avoid ma major blunders. You take components of human existence and methodically build a case by examining them one by one in this book. Health, sustenance, peace, democracy and so on. Personally speaking, I found this approach really persuasive, but there were two areas which troubled me. I wasn't comfortable with them and I wanted to ask you a little bit more about them. One of them was your chapter on the environment, um, where you characterise certain elements of the environmental movement as prophets of doom, who view humanity as a scourge of planet Earth. Um, you, you, you say that it's not the case that human beings are rapacious guzzlers of all our resources, um, um, but it, it appears to my relatively unscientific mind that, that that is what we are. If you look at what we're doing to the soil um, with no apparent plan to improve it, or you look at the availability of fresh water, um, it seems that human beings are uh, systematically destroying a finite resource. Essentially, I wanted to ask you why are your words on the environmental movement so damning, and why does your faith that this will all pan out for the best seem to fly in the face of some of the evidence that others have offered? Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's a, uh, a useful way of looking at our environmental challenges to see humans as, on a, uh, as constantly on a uh, course to <coughs> destroy the environment. Uh, I think the idea, of, for example, of resource shortages is entirely misbegotten. The world has never run out of any resource uh, because we don't need resources. We need ways of, uh, of moving, of heating our homes, of reading at night. And whatever what the resource that we use at a particular historical time depends on available technology. And as a resource starts to become scarce, the price rises, and so we are incentivized to recycle or to switch to some more, uh, more abundant resource. Uh, likewise, fresh water, it's not that, that uh, we're uh, uh, necessarily going to use the last drop. It still evaporates and falls from the sky. We do have to be wiser about how we use it. Uh, likewise with, with uh, soil. But we know that, that it's possible to, to do it by looking at the most successful cases. Uh, if we look at, say, uh, precision agriculture, pioneered, for example, in uh, Israel, where they get enormous productivity over in a rather unpromising uh, desert environment because they're smarter about how they use water, uh, about how they use land, uh, that that points the way to getting what we want, namely comfortable lives, without continuing to da damage the environment in ways that we have. Uh, so I argue for uh, applying ingenuity and uh, technology and economics, that is pricing the things that we want people to do less of, like emitting greenhouse gases, so that the combination of technology and uh, incentives uh, driven by, by a government, by taxation, by policy, will steer us in, in a better direction. The other area I wanted to challenge you on, if I may, is around inequality. You aim to torpedo the notion that the world is becoming more unequal. And you make the very fair point that um, we don't correct inequality by taking stuff away from rich people and making them suffer for, for having been wealthy. And instead, we should raise the bar for everyone. Um, but if you look at some of the examples of inequality, for example, take Jeff Bezos, who's the, not only the richest man in human history, but uh, apparently if he was a country, he would rate as the 56th richest country in the world. Or to put it another way, he's richer than the 48 poorest nations on earth. Um, when you look at an example such as that, uh, you can't help but think, where is the equality? Where is the fairness? The scales seem not so much off kilter, but smashed to smithereens. Well, yeah, I, I, I do disagree with that way of looking at things um, because uh, what should concern us is not how rich Jeff Bezos is, but rather what is the, the, the fate of poor people. Uh, it, it's the, we know from uh, examples where people are raised out of poverty, such as China, such as increasingly what's happening in, in India and in Indonesia, they didn't do it by finding a bunch of, of billionaires and confiscating their wealth. I mean, whether or not that's a good thing to do, that's just not the best way of uh, saving poor people from misery and hunger and, uh, and disease. Uh, and even thinking about it, the, couching the problem as being outraged by Jeff Bezos as well, is just not, not the right, not morally, it is not where our focus should be because there's nothing that says that the distribution of income and wealth should be equitable in the first place. It's not doled out by a committee. It's not as if someone is making an unfair decision by allocating more money to Jeff Bezos than to someone else. We Experience tells us that an economy in which 
the, uh, the income is not decided upon by a central authority, but is a byproduct of people making voluntary decisions, is better for, uh, for, for everyone. And what is morally an outrage is that anyone should be hungry, is that anyone should be sick, is that anyone can't, should not be able to afford to, to go to school or to, to uh, clothe their children. Uh, and that's, uh, that may call for a more graduated income tax. I'm certainly in favor of that. It may call for greater social spending to help the least well off. But the gap between Jeff Bezos and everyone else is just morally irrelevant. Uh, what we should do is figure out the best possible way of uh, giving people what they need to, to uh, lead a healthy and satisfying life. I hesitate to ask a question as mundane as one on Brexit, but I've been reading your book and you repeatedly make the argument that human cooperation throughout human history has been both a catalyst for change and a beneficial result of that change. So would you class Brexit as an anti-enlightenment development? Uh, I, I would. Uh, 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 an important Enlightenment idea, probably attributable to Immanuel Kant, is that organizations for international cooperation are, are a really good thing. They uh, make the outbreak of war less likely because uh, if countries' interests are enmeshed in trade, then they are uh, less likely to try to plunder each other. And the EU did win a Nobel Peace Prize, deservingly, I, I think, for having something to do with the fact that Europe has had 75 years of peace after uh, millennia of uh, warfare, uh, that we have more in common as humans than we do as a particular nation. We all want to live long lives. We want to, our, our children to be educated. Uh, we want not to be impoverished. Um, the world does come together with truly admirable goals when it has to put its head together, such as the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, that forcing your vision to uh, encompass uh, areas that are bigger than a country has led to really good things for, uh, for uh, humanity. So these are our, our philosophical uh, long-term uh, appreciations of organizations like the EU to say nothing of the various um, imbroglios and snafus and um, uh, cock-ups that are, are accompanying the process itself as, as we speak. Uh, um, I wanted to ask you a question about fake news because it's everywhere and here in the UK um, senior politicians have mocked and de devalued the worth of experts. Um, your book seems to be the shining antithesis, if you like, to fake news and the manipulation of facts. Um, and yet truth continue, continues to be distorted wherever we look. Um, why is it still so much easier for the media and politicians to distort facts than to enlighten us? Well, it, uh, the um, propaganda and distortions and self-serving uh, lies have been around for as long as leaders have been around. Uh, and uh, so that, that's by no means a, a new thing. And we know that past incidents of uh, what we might now call fake news, or at least uh, propaganda or self-serving uh, biases, have, have led to, to true harms. The Spanish-American War was fought over a lie, the, the invasion of Iraq with uh, the uh, dubious intelligence and weapons of mass destruction, the war in Vietnam escalated after the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, uh, uh, other ethnic riots and lynchings. So th it's, I think, endemic to human nature that we uh, circulate stories that uh, either make the, the storyteller look better or that recruit allies into a, a coalition that is, is formidable. And, and people want to people belong to uh, big influential formidable groups, and one way to do that is to demonize an outsider. And social media probably are making that uh, easier, at least they're the lowering barriers to entry. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the search for disinterested truth is, just, is always a challenge for our species. And we have institutions like fact-checking and uh, peer review in science and juries in criminal trials and burden of proof on the uh, prosecution, checks and balances in government. And we, we need those institutions. Without them, we know that the truth doesn't have a chance. I'd like to turn now, if I may, to your literary influences, and first of all to ask you, what's currently on your to-be-read pile? Oh, 
You know, now, now the uh, stream of, of uh, articles and uh, essays and opinion pieces is so uh, overwhelming from, from, uh, uh, from uh, electronic media that uh, it's hard for me even to think what I want to read first. Uh, I have, uh, well, let's see, I'm currently reading uh, a, a book in manuscript. I get a lot of books before they're published just because I have you know, friends and, and associates who write a lot of books. I'm reading a book by uh, John Mueller, a political scientist in the United States who was an influence in um, my book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, a book called um, Embracing Threatlessness, The Case for uh, Appeasement. Uh, a, a provocative book. I'm uh, reading a book by Adam Gopnik uh, in defense of uh, liberal values. I'm doing an event with him and it's kind of consonant with my own themes. Uh, what else am I reading? And then I have a stack of books that are on my nightstand that I hope to get to someday and I don't know when I will. Which books then were most influential in shaping your career direction and your worldviews? Um, certainly uh, books by Noam Chomsky like uh, Language and Mind, Reflections on Language. Uh, influenced my ideas on uh, language and cognition. Uh, I read books by cognitive psychologists like George Miller, uh, not a household name but probably known to every psychology student as the originator of the uh, theory of the magical number seven plus or minus two, the capacity of, uh, of short-term memory. And my graduate advisor, Roger Brown, one of the founders of the studies of study of uh, child language acquisition and uh, both Miller and Brown were, in addition to being pioneering psychologists, were superb stylists. And they flouted the, uh, the stereotype of uh, the academic as the turgid, stuffy, uh, pompous writer. Um, I, I was influenced by, by books in, in um, uh, analytic philosophy, uh, by uh, um, 20th century philosophers like A.J. Ayer, Bertrand Russell, Gilbert Ryle, who also combined a, uh, a razor-sharp analytic mind uh, with, uh, with um, wit and, and style. Uh, they, having written a uh, style manual myself, The Sense of Style, and, and uh, having lectured on good writing to the graduate students at Harvard to try to get their careers in, in, a, uh, in the right direction, not that they don't become stuffy, uh, obscure writers. Uh, I'm often, I often get the question from the students, uh, well, don't you have to write badly to succeed in academia? Won't people not take you seriously if you write clearly? If they can understand what you say, how sophisticated could your ideas really be? And I have to remind them that at least, at least in, in uh, some academic fields, including uh, Anglo-American philosophy and in uh, our own field of psychology, some of the most famous psychologists have been uh, brilliant stylists, starting with William James, another influence, uh, my uh, office at Harvard is in is a building called William James Hall, and uh, he was uh, hilarious. He was clear. He was funny, uh, a, as well as being uh, profound and, and insightful. B. F. Skinner, another famous psychologist of the 20th century, was a, a superb writer. He originally wanted to be a novelist. In fact, he was a novelist. He wrote a, a, the novel Walden too. D. O. Hebb, a famous. Canadian psychologist who has, has achieved new fame as uh, in neuroscience and artificial intelligence posthumously, but also an aspiring novelist and a fine academic writer. Um, Stanley Schachter, uh, Harry Harlow, all of these great psychologists <coughs> were crystal clear writers, often uh, irreverent, often humorous, and all of them were, were an influence in, in uh, honing my own style and an inspiration that you really don't have to be uh, obscure to, to be a successful uh, academic psychologist. If you hadn't pursued academia, teaching, research, writing books, can you imagine what other career path you might have taken? I, um, I, I was tempted at, at, at um, various times with computer programming, just liking the, um, the precision and uh, the formal beauty of uh, achieving a human goal with uh, precise formal operations. The other possibility could have been law, uh, perhaps particularly constitutional law, uh, issues in law that, uh, that depend on uh, legal theory and therefore shade into philosophy. Your work has been critiqued by such writers and thinkers as George Monbiot, John Gray and Jeremy Lent. Do you read the reviews written by those who detract from your own views? And have you read any criticisms which have given you pause for thought? 
Uh, well, I, I do read them. I, I consider it to be a responsibility of a, of a, of a nonfiction writer, at least one who makes a, a case, to be aware of the, um, the criticisms. And, and as an academic, I have long experience doing that in reading uh, peer reviews after having submitted journal articles. So that, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's not fun, and I have to choose the right time and place. But, uh, but I do, and I have replied to the uh, reviews of uh, Enlightenment Now in an article called Enlightenment Wars, uh, Reflections on Enlightenment Now, a year later, published in, in uh, Quillette. Uh, I was not, by and large, I, I was not um, blindsided by the negative reviews because I, uh, having discussed many of the issues in, in uh, presenting the better angels of our nature and having read widely and anticipated many of them in, in the book, um, I, I, I knew what the landscape looked like. In fact, one of the reasons that both th those books were so long is that I preemptively dealt with what I thought were the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, hardest counterexamples. Uh, in particular, in Enlightenment Now, unlike earlier books on progress, which also presented data, which also made the case for progress, I decided to uh, devote chapters to, to each of the major threats to progress that tended to be omitted from, from uh, other books on progress. I had a chapter on the environment, I had a chapter on inequality, I had a chapter on existential threats like nuclear war and uh, the possibility of, of uh, superbugs and cyber sabotage. I had a chapter on um, the future of progress, including uh, authoritarian populism, which is the uh, direct opposite to Enlightenment ideals. So as a result, there weren't many uh, um, criticisms that I hadn't thought of. Probably the, the, the biggest one that I hadn't is the idea that I, I just cons considered and continue to consider too preposterous to take seriously, which is that the Enlightenment was the, uh, the, the um, uh, inspiration for racism and imperialism. Uh, that just doesn't work uh, just surely by the, by the calendar. Racism is as old as humanity, imperialism is as old as civilization, and uh, it was the Enlightenment that led to, the, uh, to the, the first systematic attacks on racism and imperialism and uh, to their eventual demise. Uh, so I, I, this seemed so contrary to the basic direction of history that it did not occur to me that that would be a, a, something that I'd have to, respond, I'd have to respond to. But I did in Enlightenment Wars. One final question I wanted to ask you then is, one gift of the Enlightenment is surely to enjoy the freedom to pursue greater knowledge and open new horizons. Um, which field of human endeavor do you anticipate will bring the most thrilling advances in, say, the next 20 years? Oh, uh, let's see, artificial intelligence, I think, well, neuroscience, uh, uh, behavioral genetics, as we, we start to decode the, the uh, genome, uh, and then uh, the uh, intersection between um, uh, network theory in mathematics and computer science and social phenomena. How do things go viral? How do things become common knowledge? Uh, how, what, is the, uh, how, what are the ways in which individual psychology, when people interact with one another, result in social phenomena? Stephen Pinker, it's been a real pleasure to meet you and talk to you today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.